All right. Uh, welcome everybody to the uh, regular meeting of Fox Rose School Committee uh, for March 7th, 2023. As with all our regular business meetings, this is being uh, recorded and televised in the moment. Um, for funsies, since the uh, Super Bowl is over, I suggest you all go back and uh, look at previous meetings because um, that's just a hoot. Um, and there we are. Our first item of business is um, uh, different than it normally is. It's going to be uh, with uh, the Fox Rose Board of Selectmen, and it's a vote on the unexpired term fulfillment for Foxborough's representative to Southeastern Regionals District School Committee. And so that's a, a bit unorthodox. And, and, and with that, we will open that section of our meeting. Let them move. And uh, if any members of the select board would like to come forward and open your meeting, we are so grateful for your flexibility and your presence here tonight to make this uh, very important matter move forward. You have made us come. Yeah. Well, she, she <laughs> does the, the that. Four out of five here, too. <laughs> she does that. All right. So um, as uh, Brent just said, opening the Board of Selectmen meeting for Tuesday, March 7th, to make a joint appointment to the Regional School Committee. Uh, motion to open the select board meeting. I'll second it. All right, and there's four out of the five members here in person. So um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 So now the joint meeting is in session. Um, and I'll say a few words. And uh, if any uh, fellow members of the subcommittee would like to chime in, uh, as ever, um, you are more than welcome, as you'll probably say it better than me. So um, once we found out we had an opening uh, for the Southeastern, Southeastern Regional uh, School District's School Committee Rep, um, uh, members of this board in consultation with the select board decided to set up a subcommittee uh, because no one person should be deciding this. And since both boards have to jointly vote on this position, and it is of uh, integral importance to uh, the, the community of Foxborough to have our representative um, in place for the full term of, of that school committee. Um, th our subcommittee, um, thank uh, thankfully, uh, from Dr. Uh, Berdos's good offices, um, uh, had a, a handful of, of, of interested parties because of a, a notice that uh, Dr. Berdos had put out. And um, through various discussions therein, we were uh, weaned down to two incredibly high qualified candidates. Both of those candidates uh, met with the full subcommittee um, for quite some time, um, and, and, and we, we, we talked to them um, at length um, with formal questions and then sub subsequent discussion, looks at references and, and, and the like. And um, the candidate pool, as I said, was very, 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 very qualified, and yet the uh, subcommittee did come out of that process with a unanimous recommendation. Um, the, the, the unanimous recommendation was for uh, Ms. Jen Souza, who is uh, joining us here tonight. Um, I believe the select board and school committee have a copy of her resume um, um, uh, in their packets. And uh, if Ms. Souza would like to come forward and, and we would love to just have the opportunity to say hi um, and perhaps any, any, any committee member on either board uh, can, of course, ask questions of Ms. Souza, um, provide comments or whatever. And then if there's any questions that uh, select board members or school committee members have, um, or members of admin for that matter, um, have about the process, I'm, I'm happy to handle those. But um, beyond that, welcome, Ms. Souza. Thank you for being here and thank you for the inordinate amount of time you spent here uh, to potentially take up a volunteer position <laughs> representing our community. So with that, uh, do any uh, committee members have questions, comments, concerns? Well, then I will stoke the fire and say a few things. Uh, as I've already said, now my third time, the candidate pool was deep um, and rich. Uh, but uh, Ms. Souza, um, uh, frankly, uh, deeply, deeply impressed the subcommittee with, um, and I'm using words from some of our subcommittee members, with uh, passion 
demonstrated commitment to education, particularly vocational edu education, particularly vocational education at Southeastern, uh, where Ms. Souza did serve as a faculty member, um, trailblazing faculty member for uh, almost a decade and a half. Um, and in that time at Southeastern, left her mark in many ways uh, from augmenting and extending the depth and breadth that math is teached, uh, taught, teached, is taught. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> thanks, Doc. I knew, I knew Doc would be the first one to laugh there. You were thinking math. You were thinking math, not English. So it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. I speak yeah, yeah, good yeah, some yeah, days. Yeah, speak um, math. I, speak I, math I, I speak nice some days. Well, anyway, uh, where, where she piloted and then and then I was ensconced in AP math program, <laughs> something that's not Bless the norm you. in 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 voc ed schools around the Commonwealth or frankly around the country, and that's not only admirable. It's necessary, and, and I'm grateful for your efforts in that regard. Um, Ms. Sousa also served as, in leadership positions, uh, uh, guiding them through NEASC, through guiding the math department, through uh, their budgeting process, uh, resource procurement, um, chairing uh, committees that handle grants for um, Southeastern and the math department in particular. Um, and with heavy heart and a few tears, uh, voluntarily left Southeastern so just to broaden her horizons before looking on to school administration, which is something she hopes to dip into in the near future. Um, while I personally cannot imagine this scenario, you are uh, 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 leading a family while a doctoral student, while a full-time teacher, while doing all the things. And um, all of that passion shown through and the word that uh, every single uh, subcommittee member mentioned with that passion was also humility and a demonstrated commitment to listening to others and being part of a team. So that's what we saw in you. Thank you. So now I have a question. I, I like when you <laughs> ask questions. Great. Great educational background. Thank you for volunteering to do this. The role of a school committee is different than that of an administrator or an educator. Why a school committee? Um, I think that I have a good broad spectrum on the way that vocational education works um, and so I think that part of the importance of the school committee is that everybody comes and looks at the schools through a different lens um, and so that's why we have people from industry um, that's why we pe have people who have never taught but I do think there's some value in having somebody who's in education and has be is able to kind of see the other side of things and so I think that I'll have a lot of value in there um, I also you know do want to go into administration and I think that it'd be nice to see how things work from the school committee lens because I think think in my career that will make me a better administrator too and I think that just being able to see things through other people's eyes um, and the way things work in some different realms is really important um, just to, to be you know kind of well-rounded thank career. you yeah. thank you great answer yeah good answer Thanks. certainly well qualified and we love to see someone new Thanks. join on to a board of committee in town so I'm excited okay. welcome aboard any other questions? I, I was just going to say I appreciate your perspective on that. So I'm a former principal myself, and I kind of ran for the school committee, having grown up in this town for 40 plus years. But then I can give back, and I can use my educational expertise. So I really appreciate that lens on it, and it has such great value for us. I think for our school committees that we serve on as well too, yeah. to, to bring the lens from the in-house and having lived the life of it right. too, uh, but but also from the administrative level. So thanks for doing that, thanks. stepping forward. It's nice to give back to the town, too. I grew up in Market Street, right up the street. Um, and so my husband and I settled here as adults, and I have a daughter at the IGO, two more uh, that are coming up. And so it's nice to be able to kind of give back to the community, too, because they haven't been able to do a lot of things with the town. Um, so I think this would be nice as kind of a merge between the vocational school, which I really have a passion for in uh, serving the town. So I'm excited. You got a great education here, and then you went to Bridgewater State. <laughs> and I was probably your assistant principal now that I think about probably. it. From, from the <laughs> I went to the high school in eighth grade. I actually moved to Sharon. I did um, high school in Sharon. So. Yeah. Nice. Very good. Nice. Well, um, uh, piggybacking off of something uh, Ms. Gibson had said, th th there's all too often that these board positions do go unfilled. Um, and a lot of times that's for, honestly, a lack of knowledge. and, and, and the entire uh, school committee, and, and I won't speak for the Board of Selectmen, but um, our, our subcommittee as well um, was 
deeply moved that a number of people had stepped forward. Um, and it just is a testament to our community and the bent towards public service and making sure that we're all lending a hand to the, the business of making sure that, um, in this case, kids uh, in our town have the best education possible. So we're all incredibly grateful. And with that, I'd like to make a motion that the school committee approve the appointment of Jen Sousa to the Southeast Tech Regional School District School Committee. I'd like to second that. All in favor? School committee. Aye. It's 500. All right, great. Then part of, as our joint appointment, we have a motion as well and vote. Uh, motion to appoint Jennifer Souza as the Southeast Regional School District Committee Representative for a term to end November 1st, 2024. I'll second it. All right, any further discussion? All those in favor? Okay. All right, so with that, we're going to adjourn our meeting real quick. Move to uh, uh, adjourn. I'll second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Is that a record for a slide before we Yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. Ms. Souza, thank, thank you so much. You. Congratulations. Uh, I know they're very much looking forward to seeing you on the 14th. I'm excited. Thanks. <laughs> thank thank you. you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thanks. And thank you so much. And uh, Mr. Uden? Hi. No, no, you're fine. I just wanted to say thank you as well for all your years of service to both Foxborough School Committee, Southeastern, and the town writ large. We're, um, uh, we're blessed to have people in this town that deeply care about our kids and their safety and their education. And, um, that's a blessing I think we all enjoy in this town and every aspect of the town's education of our children. That's thank deeply you. felt. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you everyone. All right, uh, continuing with the uh, Foxborough School Committee regular public meeting. Um, next up is open public comment. Um, do we have anyone? Okay, uh, no one here is, uh, has signed up for open public comment, but we like to use this time to remind folks that you are of course welcome uh, to these meetings for open public comment. It's less of a discussion, more of a time to just comment on things. Um, as uh, in, in addition to that, we do have a community inbox. Um, that's available to anyone 24 seven and those messages do get to every member of the school committee um, pretty much um, in real time um, and and we want to thank uh, those folks a handful of folks submitted to the open public comment in this last round so moving forward from there we'll look at approval of minutes for February 7th 2023 uh, do any committee members have Questions, comments, concerns, or edits for the February 27th, 2023 minutes? Okay. I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes for the February 7th, 2023 meeting of the Foxborough School Committee. I second. Thank you, Ms. Ladani. Thank you, Ms. Raymond. Um, all in favor? Those are approved for publication and uh, dissemination. Uh, 500. Thank you. That was a robust meeting. Thank you so much, Janet. Those are very good. Um, next are the um, subcommittee uh, for the Southeastern Regional uh, School Committee posting for February 16th, 2023. Um, that was a subcommittee. Um, uh, members of the school committee were just uh, me and Ms. Ladani, uh, but if um, members have questions or things to add or points of clarification, since it was just Ms. Ladani and myself representing, um, we would be happy to fill in. I'd move to accept the subcommittee minutes of February 16th. Second. Like to second. Ooh. Thank you both. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we'll go with uh, Mr. Pierce and Mr. Canfield um, seconding. Um, all those in favor? Thank you for that, everyone. I appreciate it. It's uh, 500. Those are now also approved for publication and submission. Next, uh, our teaching and learning highlight, Burl School. Uh, Ms. Wor Ms. Parr, Mr. Worth, uh, Ms. Bean, Ms. Whitehouse, and um, Ms. LaCava. Um, uh, Ms., um, Dr. Berdas, would you like to introduce anybody? I would love to invite all of you up. Please do. Come on up. Table. Um, with Mr. Worth, the principal, and of our fabulous faculty and staff here with our preschool. When we talk about K-12 education, 
we catch ourselves a lot of times and have to go back and say pre-K-12 because right. it is about our preschool. That is the beginning right. at the borough school where we host our preschool program and our beautiful preschool classrooms. But if you have ever had um, the opportunity to go through preschool, you will be truly amazed at what you see with what our students do because of our faculty and staff that are working with them every single day. It is a wonderful, happy place, and it is amazing the progress and the foundation that they are setting for all of our um, school age students. And you talk about having that as your foundation before you enter into kindergarten. It's something that we're all very, very proud of. We've got Mr. Michael Lazik here as well um, because he oversees um, that part and um, it's just I'll, I'll just throw it over to you because it's just a, a lot to, to learn Thank you so much dr. Bertos. Um, so Miss Diana Parr and I uh, our, our promise to the preschool uh, Teachers and team was that uh, we would kind of take care of this presentation and they would come <laughs> uh, We got them all here so you didn't um, want to come you. up. <laughs> but we are, we are extremely grateful that they came. I think that um, their presence here really shows their, their uh, unwavering dedication to the preschool program, um, taking time out of their evening to come here tonight. Um, so it's, just, it's really a meaningful way to start um, our presentation. Um, and thank you so much for allowing us to present on this. Uh, and thank you for all the support. Um, I'm honored to speak to you tonight about our preschool. Um, it's an incredible place. It has an incredible impact on all of our students. Uh, like D Dr. Berto said, when we talk about the preschool, um, we're really talking about the pre-K to 12 education. Um, and I wanna make sure that um, we never, um, you know, it's never an oversight. We never forget about that important piece. Um, it's, uh, it's a hidden gem at Burl. Um, I, uh, there's so, so, so many wonderful things um, that happened at the Burrow School. And I had a really hard time figuring out what I wanted to present to you tonight. Uh, in fact, from the time that I signed up for this in August, uh, I, I was giving it a lot of thought and really racking my brain. What, what do I want to present? What's the most special thing at the Burrow School out of everything? Um, and I determined that that was preschool. Um, preschool is unique because um, it's something that we not only take pride in at the Burrow School, but we can take pride in the preschool as a district. It's something that serves the entire community and it's something that uh, is truly special um, and uh, not overlooked, um, but sometimes forgotten within the, uh, within the school district. Um, I often rave about the preschool to everybody, uh, anybody who will listen. Uh, I was speaking about it in a, in a meeting that I had with Mr. Michael Lazik one day and, uh, and he said, wow, you really love the preschool. And that's kind of when I had the realization it's something that I should present on. It's something that I should bring forward as a teaching and learning highlight and really um, show what a great uh, program we have at the Burrell School. Um, the first thing that I'm going to show you tonight is a video. Um, I went into one of the preschool classrooms a few weeks ago. They were talking about kindness. They had just read a book about kindness. Um, and they were going around the room asking students what kindness meant to them. And one of the boys in the class said, kindness is giving love out. And I thought it was such a simple way to put it, and it was such a, a way that I had never really thought about kindness before. And kindness is something that we talk about in K-4 to education, in K-12 to education, something that we really uh, value in our community. Um, so you'll have an opportunity to see some students uh, talking about kindness and responding to the question, how can you be a kind and caring friend? How can you be a kind and caring friend? Um, to share candy. Saying I love you. To say compliments. We can hug someone. I love being kind because I, I love to be a special kid to everyone. And I love everyone, so that's why I want to be a kind kid. I don't want to be a mean kid because I want to be a kind, very kind kid. And hold hands and give everyone hugs. Like when someone gets married and kisses someone else. <clears throat> and she tells all about her guy. You can give hugs. You can, uh, some people, what else that, that, that tells you that you love them? And you can and you can uh, become best friends. Maybe someone in the backyard and go on an adventure with friends. 
<laughs> a lot of hugs going on. A lot of hugs. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. So, um, and kindness is just one thing that they touch upon in preschool, but it's such an important piece of, um, of you know, learning to be a student, learning to be a community member, really learning to, um, you know, do well uh, by the community. Um, so, who we serve, um, I'll pass it over to Diana. Yep, we serve um, any child in Foxborough, um, our preschool you have to be three years old. Oops. I don't like to use the microphone. Yeah, I forgot to mention Thank you. <laughs> you have to be three years old by August 31st, um, all the way up to five years old. So some kids we have, depending on where their birthday falls, we have for three years. Um, sure. Students that also attend are uh, eligible for programming based on their disability or their educational needs. And um, the lottery system um, and we have many classes um, three classrooms one sub separate two integrated and um, morning sessions afternoon sessions um, two three and four day sessions for the kids to come in the classrooms uh, they serve up to 16 students um, as well as a substantially separate classroom oh. like Diana was saying we offer two three and four day classes for um, for peer models in both the morning and afternoon sessions um, I just want to point out this is uh, one of the newly added um, structures on our preschool playground <laughs> that students enjoy on a daily basis m multiple times a day You can see from some of the pictures um, what our preschool classroom looks like. It's, uh, it's interactive, it's hands-on. Um, students aren't just you know, sitting down, they're, they're really constantly moving throughout the day. They're making decisions, they have autonomy over their learning. Preschool's committed to offering the environment that encourages diversity, inclusion, and cooperation. I hear often that, oh, Foxborough's not that diverse. Um, and if you come to the preschool classroom, uh, it's pretty diverse. Uh, we have lots of languages. We have lots of different cultures. Um, we um, do skill acquisition through a multi-sensory approach. As you can see, the bottom left is a dramatic play setting that was an ice skating cafe, and they are making hot chocolate and um, serving customers. Um, there's some, I believe that's snow that they're writing letters in on the top left and top right. Uh, and this was in the winter, obviously. We didn't get much snow, but um, there we are trying to teach snow in winter without any snow. <laughs> so we made it ourselves. Um, it's just an approach that um, when you're teaching a particular concept, we do it in every developmental area. So you're getting it in language, you're getting it the cognitive piece, you're getting it in the math piece, you're getting it in the numbers, the letters, but it's all based on that same kind of themish type of thing um, so that we touch on kids different learning styles and intelligences. I was down in preschool um, shortly before Thanksgiving this year. Um, they were talking about fall harvest. They were talking about vegetables. They were talking about sharing with the community. And they had built a grocery store in the classroom. And they were actually um, going through. They were using money. They were uh, buying groceries from the grocery store. Uh, two weeks ago, I walked in, and they had built a mail, uh, a mail room. So they had a post office. Um, students were telling me about what the post office is, what, um, what service a post office and um, post office workers play a role in the community. They, it was unbelievable. It, it completely blew me away. It got pricey for stamps, though. It did. Yeah, I couldn't <laughs> afford it. I couldn't afford it. Very pricey. So our approach, the Burl Integrated Preschool provides an enriching, development, developmentally appropriate experience for students, and you'll, you'll see that throughout tonight's presentation. Um, we focus on early learning, socialization, social emotional learning, school readiness, language development, and cognitive development. Um, the staff consists of special educators um, who are classroom teachers as well, educational assistants, speech and language pathologists, occupational therapists, physical therapists, and the school counselor. Um, very collaborative in supporting um, each student and most of our services are pushed in the classroom so everybody gets um, small group work 
Everybody gets access to the OT if you need it, even if you're not on an IEP, we fold you into a group. Um, it's a lot of that MTSS that you've heard over the past couple of years, um, and that kind of support, and it starts at the preschool setting. You can see the PT um, working with the student. Um, that's actually a physical therapy working on standing. Um, and the occupational therapist is down at the bottom, and classroom teacher, top right, um, and assistant working one-on-one -on -one with a student in the classroom. Um, and it looks like everybody, you can't tell who is what or who is who. Everybody, it's all inclusive. You wouldn't know who the teachers were and the assistants, and you don't know who the students um, requiring services are either. So. I think that's something that's really special, that the staff works really hard um, to make that flow and that continuity of, of care and programming. It's truly the, the way that the staff works collaboratively with one another is exemplary. It's, it's, it's a model for how collaborative teaching and collaborative <coughs> learning should look in, in a school at truly any level. It's, uh, it's, it's really an amazing thing to see. We, um, we, we had hoped to uh, have a parent or students come here. Um, I joked with someone a, a few minutes ago that um, it, this is kind of on the edge of students' bedtime in preschool. Um, <laughs> I have a daughter who's in preschool, and uh, she has a, a very consistent 7 o'clock bedtime. So unfortunately, we weren't able to have students come and visit tonight. Um, we did, however, have a, a parent who um, very kindly and graciously um, created a video to watch. Um, and this is really our why. This is why... Um, you know, the preschool team does what they do every day. Hi, my name is Tiffany Elliott and I'm the mother of Wendy and Abby Elliott. They are five years old and they have spent three incredible years in the preschool program at the borough. Our girls were born at 26 weeks at one pound 10 and one pound 11 ounces. They had a four month stay at the Brigham and Women's NICU, and we had early intervention immediately after discharge from the hospital. I had left my job to care for them full time and it was emotionally and physically exhausting to juggle the many appointments, therapies on top of being a new twin mom. When their third birthday arrived to transfer services to the public school system, we really didn't know what to expect or how others would really react to our children's delays. Every medical professional had told us that most micro previews catch up by their second birthday and we knew that that was not the case with our children despite us doing everything by the book. At the services evaluation meeting with Diana Parr and the staff, we brought both of our girls. Wendy had separation anxiety and sensory processing, especially with loud noises like fire alarms. And Abby, who had been diagnosed with autism at 22 months, was inconsolable at her evaluation. She was irritated with any interaction and comfort and was unable to even complete it due to her fear and anxiety. She did not walk yet, on top of having a vision impairment and a gastric feeding tube. Diana and the staff were clear from the beginning that we had a team of caring and proactive teachers to help lead the way and we are all on the same page in our goals of ensuring that both girls were going to be learning in the least restrictive environment. A great example was evident from day one. At pick up and drop off, Abby's teacher, Stephanie Whitehouse, brought out her umbrella stroller so that we didn't have to park and carry her into school. For three years, both girls qualified for services and would be provided with support in the classroom and on the playground to help them thrive. Today, I'm amazed at the progress that I see in both of my girls, Wendy, Social butterfly, making friends with anyone she meets. She celebrates differences and embodies true, genuine kindness. She is learning to identify her feelings when she encounters frustrations and help others when they are challenged. She's able to calm herself down and has embraced being more independent in her activities. Abby has done a complete 180 from her evaluation. She's the snuggle queen who loves to visit the gross motor room with her birthday twin, Abby Lagerval. With the help of her speech teacher, Kathy Mulcahy, she is trialing an AAC device with great success. She took her first official steps with Sue Snyder at ESY the summer of 2021, only two months shy of turning four. But most noteworthy is that she has matured emotionally and socially under the considerate, caring watch of her teacher, Stephanie Whitehouse. 
Stephanie has gone above and beyond to ensure that Abby is supported and given the time for her to learn on her own terms. This has become the secret sauce to Abby's learning model. Abby has the ability, but she has to call the shots. She learns different, not less. Stephanie sees that and respects those boundaries. We are so grateful that we are in the public schools at Foxborough and that our girls have had the incredible support of the preschool program. It's a tremendous resource to families with special needs, children in the Foxborough community like myself. Thank you for everything, Abby, Kathy, Lisa, Sue, Jess, Nancy, Janie, Liz, Miss D, Annie, and Diana Parr. You guys are all rock stars. That happens because of them. To every kid that walks through that door. Um, this is just one success story. So we spoke a little bit about um, our mission and some of the things that we do uh, at the preschool. Um, early learning is a really important part of preschool. Um, that involves uh, providing young children with an opportunity to learn through play and exploration. Um, we spoke a little bit about this. They have an opportunity to explore different materials, concepts, um, social emotional learning as well as academic readiness as part of that as well. Um, and really developing a deep love of learning at an early age. Um, that is one of our main objectives, um, to get students excited to come to school, to get them to um, you know, be interested in school, and really to start to develop that love of learning that we talk about at every single level from preschool to 12th grade. We work a lot on socialization, especially in the post-COVID years. Um, I'm seeing lots of children right now that I bring in through the early intervention that, um, or, and even the um, peer models that haven't left their house in a couple of years. They have no experience with playing with other kids. Um, and depending on the culture, they may not have toys in their home. Depending on the uh, socioeconomics of their family, they may not have uh, an enriching home environment um, with even space to develop just what kids develop just by being home and outside, inside, at the park. That's been gone for the past couple of years. So we're seeing some, um, some a lot of deprived socially kids coming in right now. Um, so part of the other piece of that is that it, um, they have a hard time leaving their parents more so than in the past. Um, so we spend a lot of time at the very beginning of school and through the years, uh, through the school year to help the kids interact with one another and to get safe and feel safe in an outside environment beyond their home setting. Um, this helps them to develop important social skills, sharing, turn-taking, empathy, and working together. Social emotional learning, um, it's something that uh, you know, we, we, we dedicate a lot of uh, resources, time, um, conversations. Uh, we dedicate, uh, you know, a good portion of the day to it throughout the entire district. Um, it starts in preschool. It really, um, it, it kind of, uh, it's, the, it's the foundation of, uh, you know, social emotional learning for a lot of our students. Um, we are dedicated to providing this to students as they enter. Um, like Diana Parr was saying, uh, you know, a lot of students are coming to us now in preschool. Um, they have um, increased separation anxiety. Um, they don't have exposure to, to as much, um, you know, as, as we thought that they might in the past. Um, it's, it's really important for them to feel safe, to feel comfortable, um, to be with a team of, uh, of caring, uh, dedicated professional staff every single day. Um, and uh, it's, it's a great sense of pride that we provide that to students. I think these pictures in particular, look at the team of doctors with the empathy and the care. I mean, we got a lot of concern <laughs> going on there. A lot of opi second opinions. <laughs> um, and again, on the right, just you know, um, you guys don't know the history of these kids, but that's a little boy who wouldn't ever be able to even sit up like that on that swing and the joy that he's taking in it. Um, and then on the left, um, that's a, actually a potato head with different um, facial things that they can put in it, so make different expressions just to um, make that connection. She's clearly happy. <clears throat> yeah. 
as am I every time I visit preschool. <laughs> Um, language development. Uh, preschool provides young children with an opportunity to develop their language skills. Um, oftentimes, um, as Diane and anybody in preschool would tell you, um, students come to us with um, little to no language skills. Um, and uh, you know, part of our work is providing them with the tools, the resources, the patience, um, and the professional expertise to be able to help them develop those language skills and really be successful as they move out of preschool. Um, and we talk about kindergarten readiness a lot. This is a huge part of kindergarten readiness. Um, every single one of these pieces is getting students ready to be successful in kindergarten. Um, especially, you know, over the years, kindergarten uh, has an increased um, academic demands, increased social emotional demands, um, just overall. and getting students ready for those uh, is an important part of our work in preschool. School readiness. Preschool helps prepare the children for the transition to kindergarten. As Robert mentioned, they learn basic academic skills such as counting, letters, and shapes all through play. It's not worksheets. It's not skill and drill. It's really hands-on, manipulatives, and it's fun. And that's what we want to foster with, the, with kids that you know, numbers and letters and fun and are, are fun and cool, and um, you can see it in the engagement in the in in the um, in the pictures. One of the misconceptions about preschool is that it's just play, and it's really so much more than that. Um, there was definitely a point in my professional career where um, I would have said the same thing. I would have said that preschool is just play. It's just where students kind of go. It's maybe like a step beyond daycare. I do not believe that in the very least now. I, I mean, it's truly, it's, it's an academic readiness program. Um, it gets students kindergarten ready. Um, it's, it's a place where they're learning about the community. They're learning um, you know, those early childhood skills that are so important for them. And cognitive development, um, something that you know trails throughout the, the program. Um, it's an opportunity to develop cognitive skills, um, to learn critically, think critically, solve problems, uh, work collaboratively. The staff models that collaboration for students and they really pick up on that. And together, um, you know, students, they do amazing things. Um, this is actually the grocery store over here on the left. You can see that's the uh, conveyor belt. And this was all built by students and by the staff of preschool. Um, so that got really pricey too. <laughs> <laughs> The, the kids had a, yeah, they were having, um, they had uh, labels to label all of the different, how much, how much is that cereal, we had cereal, like real food boxes and things, right, so the kids came in. What about eggs? How are eggs? Ten dollars for a wow. box of Cheerios, wow, ten dollars, right. twenty-five for eggs, it was incredible. A hundred dollars for coffee, I would never survive. <clears throat> And that's all we have. We, uh, we welcome any questions. And again, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to, uh, to present this in front of you tonight. Thank you. So, wait, Comments wait, wait. and questions from yeah. the committee? Please. So this is a requirement. The next time you come and do a teaching and learning highlight, you have to pass out tissues first. <laughs> <laughs> OK? Because there were tears throughout the entire room with both videos. Right. So that's just my only, that's my only comment, is you have to pass out tissues first. Absolutely. Will do. Thank you. My comment is more of an observation. Um, while I like watching you all, uh, while you were talking about the grocery store and the the, 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 the the mail system, everyone over here was like saying, "Yes, yes, of course, that's what we do. Yes, obviously, that's the why. Why wouldn't you do that?" And then as soon as they started the parent video, tears, uh, <laughs> which was just it was, it was just it was just beautiful to see all of you. It just how deeply. You care. Um, and I also want to add to that. that I like it's when you not add just, things. Um, it's just not the integrated class that does these cool mm -hmm. um, right. things. It's uh, the sub separate classrooms doing the same thing. It's what they do. Right. It's what they do. They tweak it to make it developmentally appropriate for whoever walks through the door. Um, everybody has a job. Everybody has a role. Everybody participates. Everybody's included. And everybody's welcome. It's wonderful. Other members of the committee? I would just say it's, thank you so much for coming and presenting to us because it's always great to see what's happening. We can imagine what's happening, but it's great to be able to see it. Um, I was just going to ask, besides um, 
you know, seeing the social delays. Are there anything else that you've noticed that's yeah. happening um, with the children that are coming to you? Any differences or anything um, else? We're seeing a, a huge increase in um, dual languages or lack of English. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, sure. And so um, that's a little bit challenging to manage because um, just because you don't speak English doesn't mean that you're disabled or that you have a disability. Correct. Um, has to be in both languages. Um, and we're not always able to test in the native language. Um, mm -hmm. Seldom to never able to test in the native language. And so it's really difficult to know. Um, add COVID to that. You haven't been out, you haven't had any exposure to English. And now we're giving you a, a test. Yeah. Um, so, so I would say that's one of the most, more challenging, more recent. Um, can you guys think of anything that else that you're seeing? I, oh, sorry. <laughs> they're all shaking their heads no. Well, so while they're thinking, I'll add one thing. I, um, there's definitely more challenges now, but one of the incredible things, not just in preschool, but throughout elementary school and probably in middle school and high school as well, I, I'm not entirely sure, but I can assume, students are resilient. They really are. Like they, they, they overcome the most difficult things, the things that you know, might bog us down, the things that we might um, anticipate are really large barriers. They overcome them, and it's, it's unbelievable. It's beautiful to watch. I mean, it really is. They, they just, students, even our youngest students, they, they're resilient. And I think if you've also added to cultivating that kind of a culture in our school that it's a kind and caring culture. So the older kids nurture the younger kids. Mm -hmm. um, always. It's, the doors are open and people are interacting and um, supportive. Thank you very much for that. I would just add, children are resilient when you give them the opportunity. And they need the resources and the opportunity to be resilient. And so thank you very much for giving these students that opportunity because it, it's hard work. I understand it's hard work to be able to, to give that. It's preschool bedtime. <laughs> yep. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Actually, I was going to say, Thank that's a great message. We should send that one home. What is preschool bedtime? How, how critical is it for our kids to be rested when they get to school to learn? It really is. I, I hate the lecture from, from the school committee, but if, if, if we all were rested at all levels of education, it would help us so very much. So that's my moment of lecture. Yeah. <laughs> it makes a difference. I mean, you said it, you know, bedtime is seven. So <laughs> good call. But uh, I was just going to thank the team. Uh, you, you'd mentioned team a couple times and you'd mentioned team as well. And so I was thinking, you know, you can you, you have to visualize it that the whole team, that whole team is moving around all three of those classrooms constantly sharing, uh, sharing ideas, adding to ideas. Right. So I think the team is really, really critical critical and and when I look at the uh, the, the pictures um, you talked a little bit about play right but um, uh, I, I hope people that are watching this really understand the depth that goes into designing designing I, I wouldn't call it play designing what's there to make it accessible to all students I don't think people totally understand right. what that is to allow this group of students for their two or three years opportunity to be ready to learn to give them the launching pad and the opportunity to be ready to learn and have some kind of base that maybe other people don't have out of the gate so it's it's just the work and the effort that goes behind that I don't think people mm -hmm. really understand the non-stop effort too you know because the kids are with you non-stop so it takes a great deal of effort so thank you thank you for all of that um, I'm sorry to be repeating all the things you just said but no thank you I, for pointing it, that it out. has to be highlighted that way how, how critically you. important it is because I'm want to do so um, as other members of this committee are um, we you we had talked about the 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 the, the, um, the, the immense uh, need that you all meet and we've talked um, and I hope we're able to talk more in the upcoming months and years about uh, what's next um, because we're all I am deeply impressed by what you all do I would love at some point to be able to say that we don't have kids on the wait list that there isn't a lottery and there's not a need for one um, 
that's more of a position statement than anything. Um, but I hope uh, you all are part of that in terms of looking forward. I've heard Mr. Yukna talk about it, and there's a lot of things that need to happen to make that possible. But um, I'm just saying that, that I would love for every pre-K kid in our community to have the opportunity that those that um, are working with you now have. Um, and I think that's, uh, uh, it's just something I think that would be good for everybody generationally moving forward. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the thank support. You. Thank you guys for coming. Thank really, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank all of you. Thank you. Um, understanding that every uh, pre-K teacher wants to stay for the entire meeting, um, <laughs> I, I do. I, I do know that you get up early, so perhaps you know you want to consider your other options at this I moment. I think that's what she meant when she said pre-K bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that wasn't lost on me. Yeah, that's not just the kids. No, Miss Parr is good at telling us to wrap it up. It's one of her many, many charms. Um, next up, superintendent update, uh, Dr. Berdos, please. All right, first I'd like to start off with congratulating our FHS Jazz Ensemble oh, yeah. for yeah. being admitted into essentially Ellington uh, once again at the Lincoln Center in New York. What a great, um, it, it's a great tribute to everything that they do and it's the hard work that goes into that. It really is something that's significant and I, and I worry sometimes that people don't realize what an amazing accomplishment it is because they have been there the number of times that they yeah. have, but it really is significant. Mm -hmm. But it goes back to the dedication and commitment of our students and of our staff. So congratulations to them for being one of 15 finalists um, to be able to get back into essentially Ellington. It's Dr. Bertos, I'm sorry. Keep going. No, no, no. I just, and you may not know this off the top of your head. So the thing that's always remarkable to me whenever we are able to share this news is of those 15 finalists, how, how many of them are arts schools versus yes. public schools. Do you know that number from that? 15? I don't know the number, but I can tell you easily, yeah. it's the majority of them. Right. It, it really is. We are the complete minority. They, mm -hmm. They're not public comprehensive high schools like ours. And if or they are, they're not going to be the size mm -hmm. that our high school is. Right. It really is extraordinary. Right. So yeah, that's always one of the things that's, that I remark, that I right. know when, whenever we see the list. So thank you. Well, and, and combining to that and piggybacking on that, for the number of years that we've had this festival, <laughs> or that, 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 that uh, um, um, essentially, essentially Ellington has been around, they've made it many, many times within that. I, right. it's, and it's not because they see the name Foxborough High School, so right. they have this expectation. It's a blind audition. They're sending in their tapes. Blind they don't judged, know right? mm -hmm. who they're listening to at that time, and they're still selected based on you know, when you think about the repertoire, what they're playing, it, it just, it really is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. No, it's, 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 a, it's, I, I it's really special. I because I think I do know the answer to it. I think it's actually even more difficult than people know. If you've been to the festival in the previous year, they, they made a rule that they limited the opportunity to only five returners. Really? Yeah. Yes. So they, they went from the, they went from the 15 overall, which was what it was when it started back in 1997, 98. And then over time, because there were returning people all the time, mm -hmm. yeah. so returners actually had a spot for only five mm -hmm. of the 15. Wow. So um, I think it's actually pretty, pretty finite to get it, to get back, to get back to the table. Mm -hmm. It's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty, pretty, pretty significant and it, total blind recording. And the people that listen to the recordings, I know the names of the people. They are, they are absolutely the finest jazz musicians on the planet. I mean, these are, these are handpicked probably by Wynton Marsalis and his band out in New York City. So these are not just any average musician. They are the best in the world. And so they have ears like no tomorrow. So they hear it all. And so, we've had a few students. I don't know what to say. We've had, yeah. We've had a few students who have sat here and, and presented to this committee who, they didn't say it, but their teachers did have essentially standing offers, like, come see me when you're done. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, come on, that's, that, that, like, that's, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible. We, we had one that subbed in, I know, I know for a fact. He graduated right. back in the early 2000s, so he's sat right next to, to Winton. 
<laughs> Amazing. That's great. Yeah, it's real. Yeah. So think about the concerts you can go to just at Foxborough mm -hmm. High School to right. be able to hear that level. <laughs> right. Yeah, true. It's great. Sorry to derail your up Sorry. No, your that's, it's, <laughs> worth, it's worth talking about. Um, so what I have is a, is a number of things that are sent out through principals emails, but I just want to bring them to the attention. It's really important. There's a lot of information that goes out. Like when we think about today's the last day for spring signups through Family ID, yes. you know, that goes out. That's in uh, Mr. Donovan's newsletter along with many other important dates, particularly for our seniors at this, you know, time in, in their uh, K, pre-K 12 education. Um, tonight we have our second playoff game. I don't know what the score is. Looks like they won. Did we won. won. Did we? Yes. Looks like yeah. they won. Seventy-one okay. to fifty-five. And yep. uh, I'm, and I, if only by glancing, because it was that garish. I believe uh, Coach Lisa Downs did in fact wear the fuchsia pantsuit that her team bought for her. I want to say it's Sabers, mostly because she always wears a pantsuit. She is wearing fuchsia. And, 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 yep, and, uh, and, and she did make good on her promise to wear the gift of the team in honor of her 200th win. That's fantastic. It's, it's <laughs> diabolical is what it is. <laughs> but, uh, you yeah. know, I've good, got good, a lot of school spirit. Yeah, really, awesome. good on them, good on them. <laughs> um, also that's taking place tonight for the first time is a joint effort between our CPAC and the Mansfield CPAC mm -hmm. at that's the um, resource uh, fair for students, uh, oh, for that. families. It's amazing um, the number. I think Mr. Michael Isaac told me there were like 60. Oh, he's still here. Cindy, still here. you're still here because I know you're going there. V vendors that are there. Thank you. That's great. So he, he's uh, trying to be in two places at once this evening. But that's really bringing local organizations together that specialize in providing supports for our families. Mm -hmm. And whether it comes to social services, whether it's emotional support, um, education, social enrichment, different activities. So great, fantastic fair. Um, I'm sure it's going fabulous. No, that's good. That's uh, well done on the effort to get that all those people together. But I think it speaks a lot of the collaboration too. When you think about, you know, with Mr. Michael Isaac here mm -hmm. in Foxborough, with his CPAC mm -hmm. and all of their parents that are involved there, and then with the CPAC in Mansfield. So great collaborative effort to really bring what is going to be um, a great resource mm -hmm. for families mm -hmm. and students. Um, tomorrow, we have another event that's taking place for parents that will be over at the borough. And that one is with um, Dr. Larry Epstein, who you've heard about. He's done a number of different events for us, and he's going to be speaking um, with families on social emotional learning and your student. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that will be taking place from 6 to 8. And, and that really is focusing on you know, integrating skills um, with students and thinking about how you can best build their competencies when we think about social emotional learning competencies and we talk about the castle competencies and decision making and self awareness and, and all of those different things that we integrate naturally within our curriculum, but how can parents also do that in a way um, within the home environment and support what's taking place in the educational environment for a true cool. partnership. Mm -hmm. um, also this week on Wednesday, just a reminder, we have our ADCOM meeting that's taking place. Um, that was rescheduled, and so that's taking place tomorrow, that joint meeting. Um, Coral Palooza, we're talking about music. That uh -huh. concert is taking place on Thursday at the high school at 6.30. And then also on Thursday, which is really exciting, Unified Basketball. Nice. Um, the, the middle school Unified Basketball, over 40, Hopefully. about 40, um, students. Great. We played basketball. We've got a game coming up, and um, that's at the Ahern Gym. So that's really exciting. A lot of interest, and then a lot of different um, districts that are going to be participating there. Our cheerleaders, um, not surprising here, they are going to the All State Championship on Sunday, right. and so they are kind of the reigning champions right. here. Um, the second time defending state champions, that's at Worcester State University. That's this weekend. One, one, that's this weekend, right? Okay. Also later this week, best of luck to our DECA students mm -hmm. as they go to states. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing that's taking place. And then next week, believe it or not, we are at the end of the second trimester for report cards for elementary. Those will be going out. And then as a, another reminder, there is no school next Friday, March 17th. That's a change from our typical okay. calendar for professional development day for our staff that's taking place. Mm -hmm. And... Um, 
Also, we've got Dr. Barry Plummer, who's going to be doing some more parent events for us when we think about social emotional learning and social development through coffee hours that will be taking place. So a lot as usual happening. And then the last thing I just wanted to mention, and I know that I've received some emails from parents as um, principals and uh, Bill has as well. We just want to thank families for the patience and understanding as we continue to struggle with our shortage of bus drivers. Yeah. That is something that we are working very actively on. One of the things that has come out that is something that we're doing in the immediacy is more communication to families. We know that if the bus is going to be late, if there's other ways through school messenger, that we're going to have our transportation um, manager and assistant manager be able to be on school messenger. So that way if families have the school um, messenger app downloaded on their phone, they can get push <coughs> notifications whenever they're sending out uh, you know, bus X is, is running late. Sometimes it's out of our control. You know, there's a, an yeah. accident on 95 and 140 is backed up, and so that's happening. But we're going to be sending out more messages in real time to give families a heads up if we have a bus that's going to be late um, when, we, when we know that's happening. And we've had to merge some bus runs. I don't know, Bill, if you wanted to add anything else there. Yeah, I, I, again, I think we unfortunately have had a number of medical uh, outs on drivers, so uh, we're short for that reason. We're also short for you know, just not being able to hire. We have a few that are in the pipeline, so that hopefully will uh, help to uh, you know, bring us back to our full complement. But um, again, a lot of times it's, it's not necessarily that we're a driver short. It's a, it's a lot of issues. We had a, an accident on South Street one day at the high school, which created a whole series of problems. Uh, we have the, the West Street... Uh, a uh, dam that's, that's being rebuilt that requires us to really reroute around the entire town to get to those areas. Um, so, you know, as much as we, we try to manage that process, it's not always uh, controllable. And, and I think, uh, as Dr. Burrow said, it's the, the obvious thing that came out of it is just us trying to have better communication. So, you know, starting uh, in the next couple of days as we get the uh, transportation department on um, school messenger. Uh, and get them trained up on it, then we will start to, to push those messages out as well, uh, as best we can. Thank you. So and as a questions? family who's been impacted by that, the communication has been pretty fluid mm -hmm. um, through tough circumstances. So my own family thanks you. <laughs> we, we know it's hard on, on students mm -hmm. and on families. And... Um, if we can communicate more in real time, we know that that will be helpful. It might not solve sure. it immediately, but communication is always good. Yeah. Any questions or comments from committee members regarding any of the numerous items on Dr. Berdos' update? That's great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for uh, the comprehensive update. There's a lot going on. It's very exciting. All right, folks. Uh, next uh, is the vote to amend the BICO, by county. Uh, collaborative agreement to add Seekonk Public Schools to the membership. Um, Dr. Barros, any commentary? Sure. So there are 19 or 20 districts that are a member of the Bi-County Collaborative, and those are for some of our students that are um, we're not able to serve their best needs in district. And so if we can, the Collaborative is a great place and partnership, and we're a member district. And there are many times other districts want to be, become members of BICO. And Seekonk is an example of one of those. They have um, wanted to become a member for several years now. Mm -hmm. I sit on the board of directors as um, the superintendent for one of those member districts. All superintendents make up the board. And we are the voting body and look to see from a budget standpoint, from a um, service delivery being able to meet the needs, whenever other districts are interested in becoming a member of the collaborative. Because partly it makes a difference if they're paying a member fee versus a non-member fee when they have students right. that they need to send out of district because they're not able to best meet their needs within their district. And so we've um, had conversations with Seekonk really prior to COVID. It was a matter of going into COVID. It was not a time. And we're at the point now to where we as a board felt that we could accept another district into the collaborative. And as part of that, every single district that's a member has to have school committees vote mm -hmm. on their membership. So that's what you have before you is the collaborative agreement to accept Seekonk as a member district starting as of July 1. And is it the recommendation of your the full It board? is the recommendation of the board to accept them as a member district. 
thank you so much for being so thorough. Um, any questions or commentary from the committee? Nope. Can I ask, uh, is there any, uh, is there a, 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 a limit that, I mean, because there could be other communities always one in two. Is there any, what, what goes into the decision? I mean, part of the decision is a matter of, Research. we we don't want to just have people come on board. We need something from them in return. And part of that is space. So as an example, we have Thank two you. classrooms at the Ahern Middle School yep. where there are bico classrooms. So we're looking kind of, it's a partnership. You have space within your building. It makes sense as far as within the area that's serving all of our districts. And that's a benefit to the collaborative of having you come on board as a member district. I don't know, Mr. Michael Azek, if you have anything else to add. Yeah, I've been um, part of BICO, if you will, for the last several years. Uh, the executive director I work for personally. Um, it's a wonderful collaborative in comparison to the other collaboratives across the state, the number of programs, resources, professional development, Corey, can you come up to the microphone? They're not going to be able to hear you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Michael Lasik. Good evening. Sorry, we should we should have said that uh, sooner. So, FICO uh, in itself is a is a large collaborative, and in comparison to the other collaboratives across the state, the number of programs that they offer within public schools, right? Um, they have roughly, I would say, right now, probably about twenty programs, right? And then in addition to that, professional development. Uh, in addition to that, I sit on the operating committee as well as a special education director with the other districts. And so um, part of the process last year was creating this strategic plan. So they're an extension of the public school system, which is nice. So whenever we need assessments, really, really specialized assessments to be done for some of our students that require those, um, they're usually our first go-to. And we just have a really, really great relationship with them because they work together with us. And like I said, they're an extension of our of our public school system here. And um, they're also a wonderful partner with us in our, our middle school program as well. Thanks for that. I'm glad you I, you came up with the words that weren't coming into my mind about the, they're, they're participating with it too. So they're participating. They offer up something to the group, which is the critical piece of the puzzle, right? Because everyone comes together to share the resources and all uh, own the resources, own the resources, own the opportunity. So I, th I think that's just a valuable piece of it. So thanks for saying that. And again, connecting it to myself uh, not being intimately as familiar with um, special education as you all are um, is this the uh, services that our students say could get through bico is in lieu of outside full outside placement or is it so um a half measure some of it, right? So, for example, um, we have some students that require TVI services, sure. or orientation mobility services, and um, it's really tough to come by. And so they, they yeah. employ personnel within their own programs that we're able to contract with. So although sometimes it's not necessarily an educational placement, it could be a uh, really specialized service that we're not able to provide it in-house because we just don't have the cohort of need of students. So instead, it, because it's so isolated, we reach out to them, and they work with us around those. And like I said, it's kind of similar to the assessments that sometimes we would recommend right. uh, for some of our kids that we're not able to do uh, right. in-house by our school psychologists and whatnot. So um, it's really just an opportunity for us to expand what we offer in the district to provide kids with the least restrictive environment here in-house while partnering with Bike So um, like I said, it's a, it's a wonderful collaborative. Appreciate it. Yeah, no Thank problem. you for the yeah. framing. Any other comments or questions prior to moving? Okay, with that. I make a motion that we uh, vote to accept the amendment to the BICO Collaborative Agreement to add Seekonk Public Schools to the membership. I'll second it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Campfield. Mr. Pearson, all those in favor? That's 500 to approve, and welcome to BICO Seekonk. Thank you, Dr. Berdos, for setting that up so thoroughly. Thank, thank you for the answer. Thank you, Corey, as thank well. Thank you, Mr. Michael Asik. Thank you, Mr. Worth. All right, with that, uh, we're going to move on to the Foxborough Public Schools uh, discussion of our mascot. And for terminology purposes, we'll say mascot versus symbol or logo. Mascot can be uh, held in for name, a warriors. Um, and as background for anybody interested, um, this is a issue that um, has come before the committee um, off and on and 
as early as uh, 2012, although it probably extends prior, but that's the extent of my, my knowledge through people I've talked to. Um, uh, with folks from the public uh, raising um, concerns uh, about about the uh, nature of um, either our mascot name or logo or symbol, which is uh, an indigenous uh, person's likeness uh, in the circle. Um, over the years, the community inbox and public comment um, have had people speak to this. Uh, most recently this last round, uh, we had some folks submit um, their, their opinions on that or the, specifically their concerns about the use of an indigenous symbols in our, um, in our symbols that we use for the Foxborough Public Schools. Um, so that's where this is coming from. Um, further as background, this issue probably would have come up in more earnestly uh, if it weren't for uh, the timing of the COVID pandemic as there was a push to discuss this uh, near the end of 2019, early 2020. Um, and then uh, school committees and administration doing what they do and, and trying to prioritize issues. This was uh, uh, very thoughtfully and soundly put on the back burner and uh, it's, been, it's been brought back. Now, um, there is a bill in the Mass State Legislature that's been kicking around a while, and it's back again. That's not why we're discussing it now. That's just a fact. Um, that, knowing to a committee member uh, requesting that it be put on the agenda, um, with and combined with public comment, and, and the past history of this issue coming up is why it's, it's coming up now. So that's more concerning, the timing. Um, in terms of how we move forward with this discussion. Um, I'm pretty loose in this stuff in the sense that I'll entertain a lot of things at, at any time as chair, but I provided a flow chart uh, in our packets. Um, public can get this as well. Um, and, and the reason for the flow chart is just to keep myself <laughs> and other committee members uh, eye on the ball, as it were, in terms of those things which are actionable by us. What are things that we can decide? Um, what are things that we want to decide? Um, and when? And there absolutely is an order of events uh, when it comes to this, if you look at other communities as a model. Um, so the main question um, before us is, in terms of whether we keep, alter, or retire Foxborough's warrior mascot, that's the name, uh, or indigenous inspired symbols uh, as part of our logo, that's something we as a committee can decide to take up as an issue or not. Mm -hmm. So that's decision one. If we decide to take it up, moving forward on the flow chart, the question is, do we affirmatively decide to keep everything as it is? That's a decision we can make. Or do we decide to make a change of some kind? And then moving on to the, what would be the second column with the gold um, circles, those questions would be, are we entertaining a change of the mascot and the name as well as the symbol that got cut off, just the name or just the indigenous inspired symbols? Those are things for us to consider. Moving forward along any of those trees, then it becomes the then what, depending on what is decided. I would uh, wholeheartedly, this is a request, not a mandate, since I can't mandate, being one of five, that we keep the discussion ordered in terms of things and not worry about things that are further down the chain before we discuss things that are more um, at the foundation of this mascot uh, and, and symbol concern. Um, that's just my preamble. So with that, I, can you for please just the general public, the guidance that we've received from MASC on why this is a school committee Thank you. decision yeah. might be useful. No, I appreciate that, Mr. Canfield. Um, and so <laughs> many might ask, every school committee member might also ask, is this our issue to consider? 
Is it the superintendent? Is it the town manager? Is it the athletic director? Is it each individual coach? And um, the, the, the decision in this state and others is it's 100% absolutely a purview of the school committee. And it's under, of the R3 duties, budget, evaluation, and policy, it's most squarely put under the policy wing of our responsibilities. And the reason it gets put under the policy wing, according to the Massachusetts Association of School Committees, as well as other state associations of school committees, um, is that any time a, um, a decision impacts the community more broadly and the schools more broadly than one program, one school, one coach, one, one arts program, one academic club, so on and so forth, it 100% falls under the purview of the school committee, um, mostly to bring public voice and unity to an issue that impacts the whole community. And that, as my understanding, is the rationale why the ball would be firmly placed in our court should this be something we decide to take up. All right, so just to reiterate, that is consistent guidance from the body that we, the Massachusetts Association of School Committee, which is the body that we align ourselves with, as well as consistent with many other states. That is they correct. They the same guidance to there. So we're, we're acting in alignment with a consistent policy that is, is broader than Foxborough or the local area. Broader than Foxborough, um, it extends to the rest of the Commonwealth okay. and as well as to other states. Thank you. No, thank you. I appreciate you uh, asking the question. So, given that the ball would be in our court, should we choose to accept it? Um, um, I would invite questions, comments, clear, points of clarification from the committee. Um, at the outset, I should have said that this item was deliberately placed on our agenda tonight. Thank you, Janet. Uh, as information only, that it's not the intent to push forward a vote tonight unless it's the will of the committee to change that. Um, but this was meant to more just open the discussion, the purpose of the flowchart and the purpose of the supporting materials provided um, in our packet um, is simply to frame out what, what might come next, depending on what members of the committee want to have happen. Understanding that all of us are 20% of the whole. And with that, I'll sit in comfortable silence. <laughs> comfortable silence? For once. <laughs> so I would, I would just say, just for you know, discussion purposes, I think in, in looking at um, how the sports teams um, have been kind of over the last several years, looking at their uniforms, what mm -hmm. they um, do for um, the boosters, booster clubs, what they're purchasing and putting on uh, the teams, um, sweatshirts, whatever they're buying. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's evident to see that the indigenous inspired symbols are phasing their way out um, over time. And so I, I look at that as sort of a message that's coming from the, the students, from the coaches, kind of in, in looking at that. Um, I feel differently about the warrior name. Um, I personally think that it's, it's a great name. It has way more than just any ties um, to indigenous people. I look at it um, as really talking about grit. You know, if you're a warrior, you've got grit. You, you're, you're pushing through whatever challenges that you have. Um, and I did really appreciate kind of the, the, the article, I guess, or statement that was included in this about Foxborough and his warrior pride. I, I think yeah. that that was very nice to be able to read. Um, so uh, that would be kind of how I look at the two distinct issues, that they are separate sure. from each other, um, and that uh, 
I would definitely be up for a discussion on, you know, what would be the next symbol, logo, what, whatever you want to call it. Sure. On that. Um, but just making sure there are quite a number of other schools in the area with the first initial of F um, and making sure that we are able to distinguish. distinguish, thank you for, and distinguish um, sure. uh, Foxborough from that, what I think is very important if we're looking forward to making any changes. I appreciate that, thank you. Um, one of the um, distinctions um, that the flowchart tries to make, and again, it's just a guide for discussion, it yeah. is not the discussion, is that I believe um, under each of the blue boxes there's something that delineates whose job it is. And um, hearing you, uh, Ms. Raymond, and talking to other uh, committee members one-on-one uh, -on -one and, and just about this issue over the last number of years, um, when it comes to if a change were made and what might be next, it seemed wholly that the uh, the will of the committee was that other people should be involved in that, and not just this group of five. Absolutely. Understanding, of course, that whatever would come forward would have to be approved by this committee for the same reasons why the mascot um, and the symbol therein um, is 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 wholly much within our purview. So, um, so <clears throat> there's that. If we make that decision, I would just like to add on to what you said. You were saying is. Um, I would very much want to see students and the art department in the high school to be part of that discussion because I think that if you're going to come up with a new logo, a new symbol, then it, students should be involved in that. And we have the talent that's there, graphic artists and so forth. Um, so if you're, if we're if we make that change, that's what I would like to see have happen as being part of that grouping. So I want to just make sure that we're following the initial guideline, which was let's not jump ahead to the later blue boxes. Let's focus on the earlier blue boxes, which is do we need to open this up for discussion or not? Because I think that we'll get to those other things. What we need to decide is this something that we're going to spend further discussion on. Um, and that, well, you know what, in that vein, and, and understanding that, um, I mean, I'm in this role comfortable uh, moving back and forth, but this is here for a guide because in terms of decisions and action items, we do need to kind of keep it um, ordered. Um, let's start with that. Um, you've heard my reasons as to why this is coming up now. Um, some of you have supplied me those reasons, and for that, I'm grateful. Um, is this something that we want to take up now? And that if, if that's the case, then we'll move on. My question, my response to that is why not? I agree. I think it's, it's, it is time for us to do something, to make a decision on, on what we do. We, we, right. To delaying doesn't do anything. Um, it is time to make a decision around what our policy and what, what Foxborough is going to do. And if it's to keep, then it's definitively to, to, as a body that represents this community right. and they're in the schools, right. to say, yeah, no, we're keeping it, and here's mm -hmm. why. And if we're going to not, then okay. I, I, I understand that. Mm -hmm. Any other comments on that? I'm, I'm a total yes on, on now. It's the, 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 no, no need to wait. Um, we have bills across the country. We have a bill here in the state, in, in, in our own state government, in the state. Uh, there's 23 logos in Massachusetts, 46 in New England, right? That's it. Uh, and they are changing year after year after year. So um, we, are, we are there. I, I think we're there. Um, that's, who, that's who we are as a community and society, and that's what we talk about. So I think we're there. Well, and to a person, I don't know anybody on this committee who joined the committee to do nothing. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> get busy working. Um, <clears throat> regardless of what that result is, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I respect you all for saying that. So assuming the yes, <coughs> by consensus, we are going to take up the issue. Then we move on to the next question. It's the change or change something. Well, so this is where, and I'm sorry. No. We had said this was information only tonight. If right. you're making a decision 
to open up this discussion, is that an action re required that we have to? We don't okay. need to vote on it, yeah. No. Okay, that's cool. I just want to make sure that we're all. Nope, the only things on here that would necessitate, sorry, Mike, the only things on here that would necessitate a vote is not our decision to discuss something okay. or not discuss something. Okay. It's if we're actually going to change something that is. Okay, thank you. Our, our, you know, in, in, in our not discussing it or affirmatively deciding to do nothing, <laughs> like right. would change no things. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, that's the way I see that. But I, pre I, 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 we do have to be attentive to that. So I appreciate that, Mr. Okay. Canfield. Thank you. So then with that, I would invite the committee to look forward at this. Um, consider your own positions, um, ask your own questions of each other, ask your own questions of administration, if they're able to help, if it, if it is an internal question, understanding that most of those are further, way further down the line on this chain. Um, and beyond that, I guess, if there's other comments right now or questions right now, um, I think, you know, we're here together so infrequently. If there's things that people want to say or ask, um, obviously we can send the messages around as we do, uh, adhering obviously as we always do to open public meeting law um, to not discuss things outside of this meeting, but sharing information is of course okay. But if there are things that people want to ask of each other, say, of each, uh, say, say to each other, I think now is a good opportunity. I, I the one thing that strikes me with this is as we're coming up with our own individual positions and we're thinking about the community, mm -hmm. we need to remember that Warriors is not just associated with the sports teams. Thank you. Any team, any group associated with Foxborough Public Schools may adopt Warriors as their name. If they don't have a uniform that says it, they still may have some other Mm -hmm. association with that name so it is more than just the sports community that is impacted by this decision of course um, and I think that's really I just want to reiterate that because we started out talking about sports which makes the most sense because that's what we associate with See, but it is the entire district that is associated with the warrior name and with whatever imagery that is associated with that as are as are our youth sports teams mm -hmm. which are not correct directly affiliated with our schools mm -hmm. and are governed by other things. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's why it, it does land in our, right. in, our in, 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 in our laps in that it is a, um, it is, a, it is a school driven thing, if mm -hmm. not controlled across the community. Yeah. I, I appreciate that distinction, Mr. Canfield. So I, I certainly would hope that we will bring this up again at our next meeting uh, as a topic. I mean, I don't know. We don't have to do that, but if we're going to agree to discuss it and move it forward and we're all in agreement that we're at a place of discussion and action, then I think we have to make sure we have it on the next agenda. I agree. Um, okay. doesn't, don't let it slide, right? Yeah. Um, okay. I, then yeah, and let's I, do it. And I'll just say publicly and amongst the five of us here, uh, I'm 100% behind the name of Warrior. Okay. Um, I grew up with it my entire life. I think the name is valid. Uh, I think across the country, the warrior name means a lot of different things to a lot of people. Uh, I think across the country, schools that have might have changed their their uh, the imagery yep. of their school system has kept the warrior name probably almost uh, to 100 percent across the country. But uh, I think many have. I think many have kept it. Um, it's maybe not 100 percent. So it is yeah, not 100 yeah, percent. Probably not. Probably not. True. Fair. True. So, but I think it's very high. Um, but I, I think that name can can carry through. But. I think our discussion, my thoughts on this is that, uh, you know, do we have, uh, do, do we, do I, do I believe in a single image and the decision, decision of a single image to identify or uh, overly, uh, uh, overly look like a race? And, and I, I think that's problematic for me, um, where I sit. And so, you know, to just pick one image to, to, to uh, pigeonhole or narrow narrow the belief of a race is 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 too is too narrow for me, okay. um, by a long shot. So, I, I, I believe in the name, very much so. Um, so if, if if we're going to put this on the agenda for the next meeting, is that then become a decision point where we make a decision on option of changing the name? changing the imagery or changing both? Is that our goal for the next meeting is to, to make that a decision at that meeting? 
I would be comfortable putting it out there for that, and then if it's the will of the committee to table or table until X, Y, and Z information yeah. has been provided, then okay. But if if the um, majority of the committee is uh, comfortable and wants to move forward, that's what will be done. Okay. Thank you. To support what you had said, um, Mr. Pearson, I think, and forgive me for not having the citation in, on, on my mind right now, I believe the term warrior comes from something like 15th century French. <laughs> it, it, and it, 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 like, I mean, honestly, it's, it's not, so, yes. it, for as much historical association as we yeah. have uh, in many parts of the United States of it being attached to indigenous peoples, that's not its origin or its global usage. So, which is interesting to note. Its interpretation, though, has become much more associated with Native American indigenous people. So, while that is ultimately that is, oh, from history objectively standpoint. true, yep. correct. I get it. Yeah. Most of the representations that you see in North America for warrior have something to do with Native American or indigenous peoples. Um, that is and also true. We need to consider the history of the name and what that does from a cultural bias standpoint. Understood. So. No, I, 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 I appreciate the point and, and accept it. Are there other comments, questions, concerns, or since we are talking about future agendas, a wish list, if it were, <laughs> uh, for members of the committee? Understanding, of course, that we don't have to get it all out here now, that we, I mean, obviously, any communication we have is subject to uh, Freedom of Information Act, and we, we share this stuff all the time mm -hmm. with anybody who wants it, but uh, anything else left to say right now before we move on? Okay, well, with that, I thank you for your um, attention and for your, uh, your, your, your patience as we, 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 we lay this out in a, in, a, in a manner that I hope is both straightforward uh, clear, ordered, and provides people ample uh, time to think and, and, and share our views. I just, I, and I want to thank you for, or to who, and whoever helped you put this framework together. I think it's useful because we could have been all over the place. So thank you for taking the time with whoever you work with, even if it was just yourself, for, for doing that to give us a frame. So thank you. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, Can I just ask a procedure question about this? Of course. If we put this on agenda item for discussion, could, can, we, can we make a decision at that meeting if, if it leads us there? Yes, or is the, that, uh, the AR action required an IO, our guidelines for the committee. That's what I thought. Um, it's, and when we adopted that, um, I want to say, what, two or three years ago um, at our July meeting, it was more meant as a guide for both ourselves and the public Great. Um, to just what they might expect. Um, but because this is a live exercise. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. If the yeah, committee yeah. decides to take up uh, uh, something that is on the agenda, it has to be on the agenda, um, then we can move forward as we see fit. Yeah, thank you for that. And I, I didn't say it with any plan. No. As much as, much as just as just open public statement that so nothing, nothing's contrived, nothing's misconstrued by anyone. Right. You know, there's just the options are there. So mm -hmm. that, that's all it was about. So it's not preconceived notion on my part at all. So and Please, I, was say, I, I have a question on, um, is there anyone, any group um, within the Foxborough community that we as a committee want to hear from before we would make a decision on this? Good point. Um, rather than leaving it up to them to come to us, is there some? The inquiries that have been currently made um, are, uh, I did, ask the Foxborough Historical Society um, if there's any information that they want to share um, beyond, uh, not, not beyond, regarding specifically the use of warriors as a uh, mascot slash name and uh, the likeness of uh, um, an indigenous uh, man um, as the symbol that's currently used or, or the associated feathers that go with that, the other symbol, which uh, people have become familiar with, um, and that is something that they're compiling. Right. Um, other than that, I have not made any uh, further uh, inquiries, but if there are, um, 
suggestions that people have, that's something we can, of course, do. Understanding that they might not come, right. but we can obviously invite comment, both written or in person. My preference would be because we would, might make the mistake of not identifying somebody correctly, but we, if, if we certainly need to invite people if they're interested in the discussion, either to submit comments to the public inbox, come and join right. the meeting, we'll have a controlled open meeting session, but we run a risk if, if of missing somebody if we try to reach out. Oh, if we try to come up with an invite list. Correct. Okay, agree. That's fair. Do we want to hear from students? I want to hear from anybody. Okay. If they, if they, Sorry, that's welcome. my purpose. I mean, yes, that's I mean, not, that's not, if, if there's a group of students that feel strongly and want to come speak like they've done at other times, then they should come and speak. But we can't, I would strongly recommend that we not hand select students or invite oh. a group to come and speak. Okay. They need to be proactive and wish to be represented instead of and we also need to identify that they are speaking for themselves as individual community members, not on behalf of the student body. Understood. Well, and similar to that, I think it's uh, useful, should anybody <laughs> be watching this deep into the meeting, uh, that we remind folks that the open public comment feature through Foxborough Public Schools website, those things are part of the public record. Those things mm -hmm. do come to all community, mem uh, community members. Um, well ahead of the meeting, um, and and anybody who does choose to come and, and, and present, that's also part of the, the public record. Although, if you do come and talk to us, it's not a here. It's it's not an open discussion. It's just that it's open public comment. Right. Um, yes, Ms. Ladonna. So is it? Oh, go ahead. Oh no, I was just Sorry, wondering to Rob and Michelle's point: Is it worth <laughs> casting a net and putting it out there through the schools? I mean. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bardo's correspondence or through the principals putting it out there to the families, you know, and the people within our community at large, like, I don't know, I'm asking a question. Right. It just, you brought up a good point. Rob brought up, brought up a good point. Like, should we, I should we put it out there? I suspect the reporter will take care of part of that. Okay. Right. Right. But that's just my own supposition. So I think my, my point to that is, I think we should talk about it at next meeting. Okay. Not sure if we should make a decision right necessarily at that point. Fine. Um, because Fine. it is something that's, there, that's tied with the community. I want to give people enough time to be able to, if they have comments that we need to, con that we should consider, that we give enough time for people to be able to do that. Respecting that and respecting that we are, that our opinions may evolve as we hear things, then what I would say is that I would put that out as a, as a question first about do we want to make a decision? Or anybody here can make a motion right. to move it or table it. And that's, that's fine. And I would entertain either because I think it would be unfair not to. Okay. Anything else? Nope. Well, I thank you all for the uh, thought and care that you're uh, exhibiting with this. I mean, you do in all things, but I, I, I'm, I'm grateful. So thank you, since this is, at least for us, uncharted waters. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, with that, I'll move on to other matters. And because I'm a creature of habit, Ms. Ladani. <laughs> Oh, it's always Ms. Ladani first. Well, I do have some other matters um, at the uh, Parks and Rec. Booth registration is half full for their summer program. So that's Already great. Half. Yeah, that's half awesome. Full and the it's uh, awesome. The applications um, just closed for staff for the summer. So cool. I think things are are looking really good for another really successful summer. Ties and Tiara's um, yeah. event is going to be on April 28th, um, so that's a wonderful something to look forward to. Touch a Truck will be May 13th. The Fishing Derby will be June 11th. So we have some really fun cool. spring and summer events coming up. 
And as always, I'm extremely proud of our NHS and community warriors for continuously stepping up to help at these events and help run them. It's really a source of pride for me to get to see this in the front lines um, and just watch them continuously show up and, and lend a hand and help us run these programs. So, um, yeah, we got some, some great kids and great events, and that's it. And a segue for community warriors, right? Oh, that's right, community warriors. So there's another group. It's not a sports group. Volunteer-based group, community warriors. Well done. Yeah, yeah well done. Mr. Canto. Yes, the only thing, um, as we were watching our teaching and learning highlight um, tonight, and I'm, this is probably more of an exercise for Foxborough Cable, I think it would be a wonderful resource um, at the end of the school year, at some point, to create a highlight tape of the teaching and learning highlights. Every meeting, they, they're always different, but there's always something oh, really idea. remarkable. I love that if idea. we could just take, if that's what nobody else, if you don't watch anything else about a school committee, uh, on our school committee meetings, that's fine. But if you just watch the teaching and learning highlights, you will know how incredibly lucky we are to be in this community. So I don't know how we make that happen, but I, and I'd be the only one that watches yeah, it like with my time. tissues. But I, as these guys were talking, I'm like, oh. we should just take yeah. these, put them together as a highlight reel. Oh, that's great. So, yeah. Sorry, Mike. Nice pass. Great idea. Uh, Mr. Paul. Pearson. Uh, I just want I, I want to make a comment. I went to the games, uh, the basketball games on Friday. Our boys and girls, our boys happened yeah. to lose, but the girls won. Um, but what I really, um, I, I travel the state a lot to see a lot of games, and this is a busy tournament time for me in running ice hockey and basketball across the state. I do football in the fall. But um, when I was at the games, I went to two back-to-back -back games, and what I saw from students and the fans was outstanding. And it should be commended because we are working hard to change the climate and culture of athletics across the state of Massachusetts. It's very difficult. There's a lot of unreasonable, absurd people out there, and it's, it's part of high school sports, and it should not be. But what I saw on Friday was not that. So I saw a group of our students in a whiteout, um, and there was a ton of students there. And, and I, I watched it, and I was there for both games. Every single cheer had, um, uh, it might have been funny at times, oh, yeah. but it was, none of it was degrading. Or, or demonstrative or aggressive toward anyone or any individuals. Right. And then I saw the Norwood team come, um, and they came all in green. So we had the whites and the greens out there. That's what we had there. And they were doing the same exact thing. Yeah, and right. then we go to, and, and the fans were great at that game as well, too. And you hear a few small calls here and there. But, but in general, I think the fans are great, and I was listening. And, and in the smaller games, you can hear it. Then we go to the second game, and the same, same thing happened. So I just want to commend everyone in this community, and um, we, we need to change it from within. The community needs to change it. We can be one community ahead of other communities, so I guess that's what we need to do. But um, our kids will see, follow what we do. The kids can lead us and, and change things for us well, too. So it was just two great games I was at. I went to the basketball game for 20 minutes before this, and the same thing happened. We saw some great athleticism. So I just wanted to just shout it out because we get, every one of our communities needs to do that across the state to, to bring about a change to this. It's so critically important. The game is for the kids. It's about the kids. It's about the students on the court. It's not about a whole bunch of other people yelling absurdity. So we got to change it. So great. thank you, Foxborough, for being a great, a great place to host mm -hmm. and, and to celebrate athleticism. So That's great. Thanks. Ms. Rainey. I really don't have anything to add at this point. Okay. Dr. Perkins. I'm just glad, Sarah, you mentioned the National Honor Society. Like, for instance, tomorrow night when Dr. Larry Epstein is there at the borough, they're going to be there providing child care. That's nice. So it's a great plug there. So thank you for that reminder. It is. Dr. Burroughs. Uh, this week is National School Social Workers Week. I'm, I'm not sure if anybody was aware, but uh, just to give a shout out to our social workers, we're very fortunate uh, to have many on our staff and uh, they uh, provide a critical service for our kids. So thank you. Mr. Yukner. Just a quick update. <clears throat> Dr. Burroughs, uh, who sits on the uh, CIP committee, mm -hmm. uh, we presented uh, the school needs, um, obviously the limitation of funds in the town. Uh, I think there was a, a good negotiation between the different groups. And in the end, while we didn't get everything we had asked for, uh, the cuts that uh, uh, were put forward would be uh, basically just to uh, reduce the amount of copiers that we buy and the 
uh, amount of uh, music uh, equipment this year. Okay. Uh, but, but pushing that off to either a fall meeting uh, or the spring to buy the, the other half. So we split it in half. It's been a three-year program already, um, and so it just will be either three and a half or four years. So it doesn't go away. Right. I think it's real reasonable. We've taken care of the major components of the, the music instruments that need to Risers be. And to we'll the... still get the biggest of the items that we need to get this year uh, with the, the 25000 So I thought it was a good uh, trade-off. Well, so. I've long supported the process that is used for CIP. Um, and I am appreciative with the town-wide view that folks take in, in, in having those discussions um, because I, I, I just, uh, I'm delighted to live in a place where people, departments have those relationships and they trust each other and they know if it's not your year on this, then we can work something out in a future meeting, as you say, Mr. Yukna. So thank you so much for all of your involvement with that. Um, for my part, um, I wanna say uh, that Again, it's a music plug. We were talking about essentially, essentially, essentially Ellington earlier. Uh, String Fest was amazing. I always love that. Uh, when you get the uh, middle schoolers all the way through the high schools, and uh, the teachers are able to talk about the curriculum development through the years, and you then you actually go and you hear it. That's amazing. It's rare uh, to be able to do that in academics, and I think it's just really special. Um, uh, induction into Spanish National Honor Society was tonight. I'm impressed that we have a Spanish National Honor Society. Not a lot of schools support that uh, in the other areas, and I know we do in other departments as well, so I'm grateful for uh, the faculty and department chair and all the um, students' efforts with that. Um, and with that, I'll say thank you. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor. All right, we stand in adjournment until the 21st of March.